CHSP. So try to remember that acronym. It's going to be up a lot. CHSP. My name is Mary. I am part of the Community Data Program team and I'm hosting today's webinar. I want to say welcome to our presenters today. We have Annick Lacroix and we have Robert Kopert-Sevich. Annick Lacroix is the Assistant Director of Investment Science and Technology at Statistics Canada. Her portfolio includes housing related statistical programs like the Canadian Housing Statistics Program that we're talking about today, as well as new building permits, construction investment and property values. Annick's background is economics from the University de Montréal. She's worked at StatsCan for 27 years in a variety of programs from environment and health to digital economy transportation and is now working primarily within housing and construction. So welcome, Annick. We also have we also have Robert and he manages the analysis, dissemination and outreach team for the CHSP. Robert studied economics at McGill University and he used municipal tax data to analyze condo prices on Nuns Island in Montreal. He also has a master's degree from Western University and there he specialized in international finance and trade. Originally from Montreal, Robert has worked at StatsCan for 20 years now. He's worked in a variety of programs from business and labor market analysis to workforce analysis and now in housing as well. So welcome as well to Robert. Thank you. Now, and Nick and Robert also have a few more people in their room with them from Stats Canada who will be able to jump in and answer questions as needed. So you might very well be hearing from a few others as we go. A few more technical details before we begin. Just want to let you know that questions can be asked in either English or French. Our presenters are bilingual today. You can put those questions right into the chat box at the bottom of your screen there, and we will answer them either during the presentation or save them towards the end where we'll have a more, um, more substantial discussion period. We're going to begin the presentation um, with Robert and Nick sharing a few slides. They're going to describe the Canadian Housing Statistics Program as well as the data that's already been released. And then we're going to take a break from the slides and they're actually going to take you a tour on the website and they're going to show you the data and then also just provide you a few helpful hints along the way for, for working with it. And then we're going to come back to the presentation and they're going to let you know what you can expect out of the future data releases. I just want to let you know before we start that these slides will be made available to you after the presentation and there is this English version that you're going to see today. And there is also a French version that we will share with you afterwards. So at this point, we're going to get going. I strongly recommend that you maximize your screen so that you can see all the details, particularly when we get into the website. The bigger the screen you've got, the easier it will be able to follow along. So without further introduction, you don't need to hear anything more from me for now. I will hand it over to Nick and to Robert. Thank you very much, Mary, um, and um, I'm very pleased to have the chance to be part of this first webinar. It's really a first for me and for my team. Um, before I start, I just want to acknowledge uh, other uh, people among, we have a very big team, but I want to acknowledge uh, Heg McCurrell, the Director of uh, Investment Science and Technology Division, which the Canadian Housing Statistics Program falls under. Martin Lessard, who is the chief responsible for the program. Uh, Eric Nelson, who has helped, uh, is helping a lot on uh, the analysis and all the logistics uh, of the, of With Mary. And also Jeff Randall, who works on census. Okay, so without further ado, we'll start. So, um, we'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk about the, I'll give you a bit of a background on the Canadian Housing Statistics Program. And then I will provide some highlights from uh, the results from the latest publication of the, that we had last week. I would like also to share with you what would be it will be the next step with the program. It's a multi-year program, and some questions that I'd like to pose to the audience, and you can answer either today or in a follow-up. So, why the Canadian Housing Statistics Program? As you know, uh, we've seen a heavy price escalation in Vancouver and Toronto with increasing uh, debt among households uh, relating to, the, uh, to housing. 
Uh, there are lots of questions on the mind of Canadian right now on whether it's um, uh, what can I buy for two hundred thousand dollar or a million dollar in my city to um, how many uh, homes and apartments are actually not occupied? What's the role of foreigners or non-residents in Canada's residential market? What's the demographic profile of property owners? Uh, what's the average price of a single family home? And uh, what, kind, what share of household income is used for mortgage payment? And what kind of residential property do non-residents purchase and where? So all these questions have been in the mind of Canadians for the last few years now. And in order to re help um, to respond to those questions, the government of Canada is committed to address gaps uh, in nationwide housing data. So in um, budget 2016, uh, provided uh, funding for Statistics Canada to start investigating and looking at options relating to measuring uh, you know, the, the data has made the purchase of Canadian housing by foreign uh, home buyers. We looked at option of surveys versus, get, you know, administrative data integration, and the conclusion was that we they had to develop, you know, and in order to address the issue of uh, the impact of non-resident or foreigners on housing or what were the factors behind, we needed to have a proper national property database consisting of a listing of all properties with can within Canada. In the budget 2017, uh, we received uh, almost $40 million over five years, and it's a plan $6.6 million per year after, to per year, to develop and implement a new housing statistics framework. Um, and the pro so there is a, a, there was also a commitment to even within 2017 fiscal year to start releasing data on Vancouver and Toronto. Um, all this uh, um, aim of the government to address gaps in nationwide uh, housing data has also um, been shown through the, now, the national housing strategy uh, that the government thrown as, as a very heavy component on data development, and we're working closely uh, with the, the CMHC uh, on this in particular. So, the uh, what is the program going to be? What's the database? What will look like eventually? It's going to be a series of um, components looking first at uh, the address and geography of the houses. Uh, and looking at the property characteristics such as square footage, the age of the structure, property type, um, the assessment value, and eventually we'll be developing the market value, the owner's characteristics, so property characteristics, and also owner characteristics. Um, are they Canadian citizen? Are they resident, non-resident of Canada? What's the socio-demographic composition of owners uh, of houses? Uh, their income, education, uh, household composition. Uh, then there is a, going to be a block on property use, whether the, it's the own owner who uh, occupies the house, or is it an investment property, or is it used for recreational or social purposes. Another block of the database is going to be looking at the financing, so whether the you have properties, you know, what's the profile of properties with mortgage uh, uh, financing um, and uh, the value of that debt uh, and the amortization. There will be a series of, we over time will be developing a um, series of indicators on affordability, uh, financial vulnerability, housing availability, market valuation is very important, the macro prudential risk. Um, there's a lot of our, uh, data set as well that we'll be bringing along, um, and I'll talk to you about the framework. But before that, I just want to uh, also insist that the database that we develop, although it's a micro database, um, the data will be released at a fairly aggregated level. Uh, we're looking at municipal level data for now, and it's going to be showing profiles of characteristics and uh, the owners. Uh, and researchers will be able to answer various questions, policy questions, using um, those variables uh, to reflect, again, geography, property, owner characteristic. Um, it's important to realize that the 
it's, it's really the aggregated data out, or there's going to be some part of it that will be available as deemed employees to researchers. And I'll talk about that later. So the framework of the Canadian Housing Statistics Program, um, you'll see on your slide, it's composed of a series of administrative data files. So for each jurisdiction in the country, so each of the 13 jurisdictions, we are uh, br gradually bringing on a property assessment role and land register data. And eventually, we'll also be bringing in um, financial transaction data so that we can understand a bit more the financing around uh, the different types of property. If you look, the colors in dark blue represent the files that are already at Statistics Canada. So they are tax file, business, there's register data, data from our business register, from our census. Uh, we'll be using eventually also citizenship data, immigration data, uh, and uh, we are already using the mortality database. Um, so all this data sets will be integrated so that by the end of 2022, we'll have onboarded 13 jurisdictions to have a property, a national property database coast to coast that should represent over 5,000 municipalities of Canada with the stock of uh, residential properties and how it evolves over time. So on the next slide, I um, provided a very uh, a visual sort of program overview of, uh, of the program. So you'll see from the left hand side you have the data input. So as I mentioned, it's the land uh, register files and property assessment file coming in to Statistics Canada uh, and eventually some of the financial data. And uh, we linking with, integrating with um, other data that we have at Statistics Canada who are coming in at the same time from other governments, um, such as, as I mentioned before, citizenship, mortality data, some data from CMHC. One data gap that we do have, we mentioned here, but that we eventually we're planning to also uh, potentially extend to uh, housing on reserve. It's not part of the immediate scope of the program, but uh, it's, I know we are conscious it's a big data gap, and uh, that's why it's there on the, on the, on the slide. The, term, the data output, um, we already had three releases. The first release, exactly a year ago, uh, we started releasing Vancouver and Toronto non-resident um, non ownership data covering our 55 census subdivision. We moved into June 2018 to cover uh, all of Ontario and British Columbia uh, with uh, property characteristic data and um, covering about 750 census subdivisions. And uh, we also covered for the first time last June data on some sociodemographic of individual resident owners, age and sex. And we also had data on type of owner. And then on December 11, as you see, we've been very busy. Um, we've been releasing a third province, uh, uh, which is Nova Scotia, uh, which covers about uh, 21 census um, metropolitan area and uh, 800, 815 subdivisions in total are being covered using the three uh, provinces. And in the winter, and I'll mention, I'll explain that a bit later, we'll, we're gradually uh, adding some more variables. And the plan is that we will be gradually onboarding all 13 jurisdictions, um, hopefully by the year, the end of year 2022. So the types of outputs that we plan to release, there are different ones. We're producing data. We have data tables. Uh, we're using social media to alert uh, people with uh, whenever we have the release. We have several infographics that we have developed, as well as thematic maps for each province on non-resident ownership. Uh, we started uh, last December, we had a first analytical paper uh, on condominium in Vancouver and Toronto, and we're going to be 
this winter adding a series of analytical papers on various aspects of housing characteristic in the three provinces for which we have data. We are also working on a, a visualization, uh, again, other type of visualization because we're working on a data visualization tool uh, that will be showing uh, some detailed information at the census subdivision level on property characteristic, non-resident ownership, and so on for the, prov the three provinces we've released and we plan to gradually add um, to that. So if we go a little bit more in depth about what's been released so far, um, I mentioned on December 19, we had our first release. We had our first release on December 19 to cover Vancouver and Toronto CMA, or 45 uh, census sub-district, uh, sub-census a census sub-district is the equivalent of a municipality. Uh, we had produced seven indicators on property characteristics, such as the residence statue, of course, the type of property, whether it's a single, a multi, or a row house, etc. Uh, the assessment value, the size of the living area, the period of construction, the condominium status, and the number of owners per, per, per uh, property. And I've put links to the daily for those uh, for that release. In June 25, we, as I mentioned before, we covered all of Ontario and BC, uh, and we also we used the similar indicators as December, but we also added property level data on the the type of owner, whether it's an individual or non-individual, which who uh, could be a business or a government entity or a nonprofit organization, and so on. We also released a still demographic uh, statue of resident owners um, based on age and sex. And um, last week we released, as I mentioned, Nova Scotia uh, for the first time. So we, we've, which included one CMA of Halifax and about 70 mm -hmm. cents, census sub-district. We also um, Included revision a new vintage stock or a new stock uh, with, to for Ontario and British Columbia, and the new vintage uh, represented annual municipal tax roll for 2018. So if you look, there are differences. There were slight differences between on the the, the stock for Nova Scotia it was December 2017, whereas Ontario and BC January 2018. So some small differences. For assessment value, Nova Scotia, January 2017, whereas Ontario is, was January 2016 and BC, July 2017. The differences are due to the, the different calendars the provinces have in terms of uh, doing property assessment and being able to release new stock uh, data. Um, we release property level data with what we call owner derived variables. So the residency statue, for instance, and I'll, I'll define this, um, is derived at the property level, although obviously it's a characteristic of the owner. Um, so we have a detailed table on that and cross tab with uh, some property characteristic. And we also have a table for the type of ownership, whether it's individual, non-individual. We've released information by province, so for in, at the provincial level, at the CMA level, and at CSD level, uh, uh, with uh, data on property type, period of construction, and we looked at the number, uh, the percentage, average, and median assessment values. So the next slides are going to be that I'll go through are series are basically showing highlights from the December 11 release. Uh, as I'll go through them and uh, fairly quickly because I want Robert to provide after that uh, a, demo, a little demo on how to access our information and uh, tables. So the first thing I'd like is just to provide a definition on what the residency, residency statute. It's based on whether the owner, First of all, it's, based, it's assigned based on whether the owner is an individual or a non-individual. So a non-individual is considered a resident of Canada if his or primary dwelling is in the economic territory of Canada. 
A non-individual is considered resident if it engaged in economic activity from a location in the economic territory of Canada. So that means that you could have a Canadian citizen who is a non-resident, and you could have for a technically a foreigner who could be a resident of Canada. So these are very different uh, concepts. And as we, over, we evolve with the program, we plan to add to this portrait of non-residentship, the, the fact to look at citizenship, and also immigration statutes to add uh, more depth to the characteristics of those different uh, housing owners in the different uh, real estate markets. Um, so uh, in the, if we look at some of the key findings, I put them on the four big uh, buckets. But, um, and, um, and the first one seems obvious. But it's actually it's important to emphasize that non-resident ownership varies really a lot based on the geography, whether you're in Nova Scotia or in Ontario, but also based whether you're in a, a big city or you're uh, outside a CMA. There's big differences where you are. So, so it really matters. And also it depends a lot on the type of property. Uh, if it's a single house, it may have a different story from a condominium, and it depends on the age of construction. And what we see so far, uh, what we see so far is that our non-residents also have a tendency to own um, condos, more um, more condos and who are, that are more recent and more expensive. And uh, so you can uh, uh, in Vancouver and Toronto, but not necessarily in Halifax. Also, another important point, and some of the highlights will show after, um, provide a bit more information, is non-resident ownership is also more prevalent outside large urban centers. We find it like, likely to be two types of non-resident owners. There's those that invest in the big cities like Vancouver and Toronto, and there are those who are really being in, uh, buying uh, houses outside for recreational purposes, Cottage Lake Country at the, board, the American border. There's a lot of interesting things happening. And also the fourth key finding is that non-individuals own less than one in 10 residential properties in Nova Scotia, Ontario, and BC. Um, own between 43% and half is vacant land. So those are some of the key findings. And uh, we, I have a few graphs and a few um, tables to show, uh, just to illustrate. The first one is about non-resident ownership rate. It is lower in Halifax overall if you compare to Toronto and Vancouver CMA. However, the situation is a bit different. Again, if you look at the different property vacant land, um, non-resident ownership is much higher in Halifax for vacant land than it is in Toronto and Vancouver. Um, and uh, similarly, in Halifax, you have um, but in Halifax, you have um, lower uh, non-resident non ownership for condo apartments compared to Vancouver, for instance. Uh, another highlight I just wanted to bring your attention on about the, va the assessment value of the houses. So non-residents tend to own more expensive properties in Vancouver and Toronto, with some exceptions. Um, the first one, if you look at single detached house, it's interesting to see that um, you have non in Van and the average value of a single detached in Vancouver CMA is 2.3 million uh, compared to 1.6 million for a resident owner. And that's 690,000 more uh, for non-resident, uh, the value of non-resident house compared to not a resident house. Uh, if you look at um, to, if you look at Toronto, you also see that single detached houses uh, have a higher average value of assessment for non-resident at one million compared to eight hundred forty thousand for residents. If you do look at Halifax, it's not as obvious. Um, you don't you, the, the, you don't actually. If you look at overall, it seems that. Um, the, re the resi overall resident owner, the average value of uh, a home for resident is higher than it for non-resident. The, the our big difference is uh, what's going on with properties with multiple residential units. 
for that particular group, uh, that refers to a property that contains more than one set of living quarters owned by the same owners. For instance, an apartment building or a duplex or a property with two houses on the same lot. So in there, we see that for Halifax, um, the average value of a property with multiple residential in is 890,000 for residents, much higher than for non-residents. Same thing in Toronto, much higher at 5.2 million for residents compared to non-residents. For Vancouver, it's pretty much the same. The other thing I just wanted to point out on that one too is uh, what's going on also for vacant land because um, there's a different stories for vacant land where um, it's uh, the res um, ownership by uh, residents tend to be higher, have a higher average value than um, the vacant land assessment value of non-residents. Another highlight I wanted to, to showcase is what's going on with um, the fact that in Halifax, Halifax is a different setup than Toronto and Vancouver in terms of um, not even talking about non-resident ownership, just property characteristics. Condominium apartments are less common. However, the vacant land uh, more, uh, is more prominent in Halifax CMA compared to Toronto and Vancouver CMA. For instance, if you look at condos, um, you have 32 point, almost 33 percent of residential properties um, in Vancouver are condos compared to 7.6 percent in Halifax CMA. However, 12 percent of residential properties in Halifax are vacant land compared to only 2.2 percent in Toronto and 1.4 percent in, in Vancouver. In terms of single detached house, um, you have 64.6% of residential properties in Halifax are single detached compared to about half in Toronto and only 35% in Vancouver. So obviously those different characteristics are um, depends on the density uh, of the city, uh, what's going on there. So it's very important to, to look, you cannot detach what's going on in terms of non-residentship to the, and the property characteristic to where you're located, um, how, how dense the area you are in. I think these are really important things to remember. Another important highlight, as I mentioned before, and uh, we have provided a bit more insight into that in our release, is that um, non-resident ownership is a lot more prevalent in recreational destinations than even in um, cities. And, uh, it's, for instance, in Nova Scotia, nearly one in four Nova Scotia properties are owned by non-residents on Cape Breton Island. It's located on Cape Breton Island. If you look at Nova Scotia as a whole, the non-resident ownership is 3.9%, but if you look at Cape Breton Island itself, it's 5.6%. The average value of single detached houses is actually much higher in um, Nova Scotia and for non-residents in um, the Cape Breton, uh, Cape Breton Island and Southern Nova Scotia, we have large, diff big differences in uh, average values. We also have situations like um, Lunenburg, a UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, on the South Shore that has non-resident ownership rate of 6.2%. So in Nova Scotia, this is not a new phenomenon. We have ferry, we have ferry routes between the state and Nova Scotia and between New Brunswick uh, and Nova Scotia. We have now direct flights from Europe. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there seems to be a lot of non-residents uh, who have acquired, not, um, you know, recreational um, type of housing uh, in Nova Scotia. And this is also true in BC and Ontario where we see, for instance, non-resident ownership rates of almost 16% in Whistler, um, BC, compared to 9.7% 9, 9 in Rideau Lakes and 5.6% in Muskoka. So you're talking about rates are higher than what we find in Vancouver, uh, in Vancouver and Toronto centers. So it, again, it's to keep in mind, there's a lot going on in terms of non-resident ownership in those three provinces. And yes, it's Vancouver and Toronto are important what's going on in Alifat, but it's not the same, it's the same story everywhere. 
finally, one last highlight I would like to uh, to, men to reiterate is um, we look at we differentiate between individual owners and non-individual owners. Non-individual is being business or institution, government, um, nonprofit organization, um, and if we look at uh, uh, the graph, we see that one, less than one in ten residential properties are in the, the hand of non-individual, and most of it is actually vacant land uh, for, for residential purposes. What's also interesting that we've tried to highlight in our data is that um, almost one in five residential properties owned by non-individuals uh, in, in the London CMA, which is in, in Ontario, which is interesting because it's more than twice the rate in on any other Ontario CMA, and about two, almost about two thirds, over two thirds of those residential properties owned by non-individual are condo apartment in London, Ontario. Um, we find in Toronto CMA vacant land uh, represents does represent a large proportion of non-individual owned properties at 34.9%, followed by condo apartments at 23.2%. So there, it's in, there's, again, there's an interesting story there, and we'll be doing more analysis on who are those in non-individual, what kind of sectors they're in, in over the winter. I will now um, pause, and I will let Robert navigate through some of the tables and the data just to show you a little bit how to find our information and to make it easier for you to go and look at our data and products. Okay, so we're going to... Mary, Mary can you... Yeah, uh, I'm going to... Um, if you'll just be patient for a minute as we switch over, we're going to bring up a screen share from Robert. So I'll just take a few seconds for things to load. Thank you, Robert and Nick, for answering those questions as we go along in the chat box. And I'll just draw everybody's attention to that chat box as well, because you might find there are questions that you have that are being answered, and that uh, is going on as well during the presentation. Um, and we'll leave that up afterwards if you want to go back and look through some of those questions as well. All right, Robert, looks like you are good to go. Okay, so I, I know that we have different levels of data users out there, and I'm going to try to accommodate both um, with a couple of comments about how you would access our data. So the starting screen that you're seeing right now is just a Google search on StatsCan, which is bringing up StatsCan uh, homepage. And right away from here, even though you're not on the StatsCan website, you have uh, options to go either directly to the data or to go to the daily. And the reason why I make this distinction is that for some people who do know what the data that they're looking for, um, you can do a search directly under this uh, tab. Or if you don't, you can actually search the release schedule to see when the last release happened for the program. Now, how this would be done, is an example, is this is what loads up as the data screen. For, uh, from the StatCan website if you were to click on data and immediately asks you if you can put in keywords to search the program. Now I've already done this just to speed this up and what you see essentially is that when I put it in, it filters out the Canadian Housing Statistics Program and identifies all the products that are available on the website. And so from here you can see that there's 23 tables that are available uh, in total from the last three releases that we've had. So in this case here, what I decided to do is this, I can click on the tables, and the first thing that's going to show up is the tables that were released by number, and right now it's showing us, for example, a list of tables, uh, and you have to know the release date in order to associate which tables that you might want to look at. So that requires a little bit more digging. The other option, by going into the daily, and looking at the release schedule is that you'll be able to identify the tables that were released specifically under each release. So the data was released, the last release was on December 11th. And if I look on December 11th, I can see here, Canadian Housing Statistics Program, and immediately it brings me to the article. So some of the charts and tables that you saw in the presentation 
uh, that Anik was showing you are already in this article. And within here, there is a tab to go directly to the table. So I want to give you just an, an impression of what you might be interested in. When we create charts or tables for the daily article, it is really a very subset of what we think we want to highlight in the article. And so if you're looking at this particular chart, you will see a limited amount of information is being presented to you in the chart. And the table itself shows you the different rates in this case here. So this was one of the charts that was in the presentation. To actually get access to it, there's two ways to know the number of the, the table, as an example. So if I show you this one here, once you know the table numbers, you can actually search the table numbers, and they're always sourced here. And this is actually a hyperlink, which would actually bring me directly to the source data that is in the chart. So if I click on such item, I get essentially a preview of what the data is. So the description of the table at the top gives you an idea of the content of the table. And what you're viewing here is actually just what we refer to as a simple view. Uh, it, obviously, this table is significantly large. It has data within it for the three provinces that are here, for every census metropolitan area within those provinces, and for every census subdivision within those provinces. And crossed by, in this case, the property types, the periods of construction, referring to the property types, and in this case, residency status, so that you can tell basically on the number or the percentage, the rate of non-resident ownership. With all of this being cross-tabbed, there's actually over 1.2 million rows in this table. So for those of you who are advanced users, you may want to go in and basically say, look, I'd like to have all of the data. And in this case, well, I'm unclicking on a button here that says add and remove, okay? In a lot of cases here, this type of table, if you were to download it in its full form, and there is an option to do that, to have what we call a full download, the full download will not load into Excel. It exceeds the number of rows in Excel. So this is where those people who have access to different types of software like SAS or Stata or even Microsoft Access as an, as an example would be able to load the data and manipulate the data. The other option is to reduce the size of the table by selecting the information that you're looking for. And these are the options that are here in order to customize the table. Your first level is geography. I'm going to show you this by walking you through. Let's say all I'm looking for is the data on Nova Scotia. I can click and add and remove based on what I'm looking for. These other boxes that are here also allow me to select what level of geography that I want. Level one is the province. I can deselect Ontario and British Columbia. Level two is going to be the census metropolitan area. Level three is going to be all of the census subdivision area. So right now I'm just looking at all of the data that's available for Nova Scotia. You can go into each of these dimensions and select what you are looking for. Do you want a summary of all property types or are you interested in having the detail by property type, which is what I'm selecting here. Construction period. You can have a summary for all construction periods that will just give you totals, or you can select all construction periods and you will get estimates for every single construction grouping uh, of years that is here. The same with residency status, and by default, it's been already shown and selected to see the estimates for both resident, non-resident, and the overall. In addition to this, you can select the estimates that you're looking for. In the simple view that is here on the website, we've only provided number and percentage. But behind the data, in, in within the table, is the median assessment value, the average assessment value, and the total assessment value. So if I select on all of these, 
I can then also do two things. I can go ahead and apply it, and I can also decide how I want to look at it, how I want to view it. So this is what we call the customized layout. Right now, the customized layout is showing geography as a row, property type as a row, period of construction as a row, the residency status as a row. The columns are for the estimates and the reference period. In this case, there's only one reference period, so it's not going to have much of an impact. But I'm going to show you that I can change the dimensions and apply residency status as a column, and I will show you exactly how this table shows up. So now it's going to load the, the view for you. And this is what I was afraid of. So you've now noticed that I have exceeded the number of columns that the program can actually view. And as I said before, it's all of the, the individual details that are here that often cause the program to not be willing to actually show it to you. And it will advise you that the best thing for you to do if you want this level of detail is to actually download the full data set. I'm going to just remove this so that we can still see a view here. No. It's still too large. I don't understand that. I thought we, te we test. Yes, it does. Okay. I'm going to remove that. Yeah. I know what's happening. Yeah. Sorry, I think behind the ground, it's. I tried to remove Ontario and BC, and I think at this point I'm actually still selecting it. Um, Yes, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry. It's by choosing when I chose the census subdivisions, it just immediately decided to include all of them. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So let me try that again. Robert, I think this is Mary speaking. I think this is wonderful. This is a really nice sort of insight to the website and good hints for everybody. If you are getting those overload, just to go back and check because you can see how things are getting selected and you're not quite sure of it. And uh, you know, for Robert and Nick who are comfortable with the data, they kind of see these things already. So, right. Yeah, I mean, I think what's important and what we try to explain to people about this particular tool is that it helps to actually identify how many items were selected. Which, unfortunately, in my demo, I thought it, I, I didn't, I wasn't looking. So now you can see I have three of 840 items selected in terms of geography. And that's where now this is why it's actually loaded the data. So you can now see the data has been loaded. Um, and again, if you take a look at it, you can see that we have in columns now residency status and the non-resident status. But all of the estimates are also showing up in columns. And that's not necessarily ideal. And it's really simple to change the dimensions and how they actually load. So for some people, this is really important because it reduces the amount of manipulation you have to do in Excel. Because when you download this, it's going to be downloaded as a CSV file, which is a comma delimited file that Excel can read. However, if Excel's reading it, you want to know in advance, how do I actually want to look at the data? How do I want the data to appear, depending on the measures that you want? So you can see, as, as soon as I change the estimate to go from column to row, all of a sudden now it looks like I have a smaller table where I have for each estimate is now providing me the information. Anytime you see totals, so for example, the total of all periods of construction, it simply means that it's all been aggregated up to include all properties regardless of when they have been constructed. Okay, so that's really an aggregation that's going on. Um, so here the data now is you, you, you can see, for example, if I want to look at single detached, and we were just looking at the differences in the assessed prices in uh, one of the tables that um, Anik had shown. And you can see here the difference where in my table, residents own properties 
like a single detached, overall in the province, it looks like non-residents have an average assessment value that's slightly lower than resident-owned property. And as you go in, depending on the level of geography you're looking at, this is where you're going to see differences. Um, so on this one here, as I said, it shows Nova Scotia over here. I can actually drop down and show you Halifax. So if I looked at Halifax, and here we look at the average assessment value for condo apartments, you'll notice that for non-residents, the average assessment value is higher than for residents. So I'm just going to jump ahead here and give you the option to show you how you would actually download this. You have download options here. And I can select them. And if I download as displayed, I'm going to get exactly the dimensions with the rows and columns structured the way I have just viewed them. The other option is to download the entire table that's there, and this is what I was referring to before. And if you download the entire table, as I said, you're going to get the 1.2 million or so rows of data with all of the cross tabulations that are included in this table. So I'm going to stop that here. And Yep. So within the products that we have as well, there are different types of products that we provide. So sometimes, as this is an example here, we did a showcase, we showcased Cape Britain Island and the actual infographic that was developed for them. And here you can see that all of the resident and non-resident rates are available for each of the CSDs, so each of the census subdivision areas within Cape Britain Island in addition to the, the average assessment value for both resident and non-resident owned property. So that's one example of uh, the type of infographic that's included here. I'm going to show you one more because this one actually gives you a better overview if you, what your interest is to look at the full province. So as an example here, where did they put it? it let's take a look at the one that's the map. And that's yeah. That's which one? Oh, it'll go to all of them. Okay. So here are similar to what you saw as an infographic for Cape Britain Island. There are actual thematic maps that can help you visualize uh, the data. And in this case here, for example, you see the gradient of colors that's showing you where there are higher rates of non-resident ownership um, on. Uh, within Nova Scotia itself. And this gives you an idea that a significant portion of non-resident owned properties are all along the waterfront throughout the province, whereas there's less so within Halifax. So these, these are things that are being created. The Ontario one actually has an inset in order to identify uh, the um, what that is referred to as the Golden Horseshoe, but it's really focusing on the Toronto Census Metropolitan Area. And in BC, you can see that the inset is basically for Vancouver Census Metropolitan Area, that the whole province looks like this. So those are a set of products that we put out. Um, in addition to this, we have also um, have other infographics that give some high-level results uh, that have been provided. So often what I recommend to people is to actually go to the daily. The, it's, it's not, if you're going straight to the tables, if you're a you know, power data user, I would say yes, go to the table, download what you need. But often it helps to actually look at the daily because all of the links to all of the products with that particular release are contained within the daily article. And so if there's stuff that you want to be able to look at, um, it's often easier to just load the daily and you'll have the links that you need to see what's available. So for example, in this case here, these infographics um, were created also 
with this particular release. And so this one here is focusing on who invests in the Nova Scotia housing market. And you can see there's some high-level statistics on both non-resident ownership and okay great you're welcome okay so yeah on your end you're going to stop sharing and then i'm going to bring back okay, the, Mary, uh, I'm done. powerpoint presentation and then we're going to Thank hear you. from a nick i believe again and then nick's I going to, to just go through what the future of this program because she like she said before it's a multi-year plan and so this is the first rollout there's been a few releases now through the daily and so we're going to hear about what is still to come Okay, so um, thank you, Mary. So uh, and thank you, Robert. I think I agree with Mary. I think it's been great for me anyway to be able to to see this uh, manipulation because sometimes we sort of uh, we we so much in a hurry and then we try okay go we have to release go go go. So um, I think it's great <laughs> to be able to see this a bit more. So what are the next steps? What are the next steps? Um, so over the winter, we don't have yet dates that uh, can come soon, but we don't have yet the dates established January, February. We'll have, we'll have the chance to explore uh, more in depth a certain number of, of things because there are a lot of characteristics that are shown very quickly, but there's a lot of things going on. And um, for instance, there's a new variable, new sets of variables that are coming on this winter on immigrant uh, status. Uh, whether you're immigrant status or not, and some of the characteristics relating to the type of immigrant and country of origin and year of immigrant ownership. Uh, we want to, there's going to be an uh, uh, economic inside article um, on that kind of information. Uh, we're going to also um, provide uh, other property level data. I mentioned before the NAIC sector for non individuals, so we get, get a chance to understand better. Who are the, um, what kind of non-individuals do we have? And there's going to be a series of articles relating to those different topics uh, that we're doing in partnership with CMHC. Uh, for, for, and that will cover the three jurisdictions. And as I said, there's going to be a profile of non-individual owners. Also looking more in depth at what we call mixed ownership, when you have resident and non-resident uh, owners uh, owning the same uh, the same ownership, same house. Sorry, um, we're looking also at understanding a bit better the evolution of living area by period of construction. So looking at the the newest construction, what's what's the profile of, of owners of the youngest or more recent construction compared to the older construction? Uh, and also we're going to be introducing uh, a new indicator on um, on the property own, whether the property is, uh, sorry, owner occupied, um, to see if the owner occupies its own uh, property or not. And uh, we, uh, we're going to be exploring this further. We're also going to want to look a little bit, understanding a bit further the phenomenon that I mentioned before on non-resident ownership outside the big city, outside Vancouver and Toronto. There's things going on, I said, in cottage country. There's also a big interest on residential vacant land. What's going on with that with that land? What is it for? Who owns it? Um, so these are areas that we're hoping to uh, develop further during the winter. Um, further into 2019 and beyond, uh, we'll, uh, we are planning to expand the geographic coverage to New Brunswick and Yukon. Now you may wonder why New Brunswick and Yukon, not Quebec or Alberta. Or, and that's because the geography coverage expansion depends entirely on the engagement and, uh, of the jurisdiction who is ready. It's a very long process to acquire property assessment land title data from uh, our 13 jurisdiction. And uh, basically it depends how fast it goes, the quality of the data, how engaged the data provider is, uh, and um, who, depending who works fastest with us, uh, will get its data. It will see its data uh, released first. Um, so, because we have connected now pretty much with each jurisdiction, but it's a question of who buys first uh, and how you know how well it's going. So, um, 
We are planning to continue to expand variables. So we have uh, we have advisory committees, uh, a federal one and a provincial, territorial, municipal researcher one that help us um, guide us through some of the priorities regarding uh, the program and what we can do or should do with the data because the scope can be very wide. So we slowly expanding. We're trying to expand the variables, make clear clearer indicators. So we. What we want to do eventually down the road is um, to create an adjusted assessment value with the same reference date. Because have you noticed, I showed you earlier, the three provinces have different times when they provide us with stock data. And, and their property assessment, time uh, reassessment chain are, are different. But down the road, we want to be able to try to model or create an adjusted assessment value so that we have a similar benchmark or reference date. Uh, we're also looking at expanding on the use of properties. There's a big demand asking, okay, um, is really the owner occupying? Is the uh, owner renting out? Uh, is it an investment property? Uh, is it a recreational property? There's various proxies to be used, and we're starting to explore some of that. That requires usually looking at our property assessment data in combination with other data sets. Um, citizenship as well. So it's not enough to be, okay, you, you're not resident, non-resident, but are you Canadian or non-Canadian? Um, also down the road, we're interested to make the link with income. And, um, you know, in terms of uh, the issues surrounding the affordability of housing, depending on where you are, the social demographics, um, and uh, that's an area that we should, uh, we need to work on. Again, more at large, can we develop further indicators of affordability in addition to what we already have at Statistics Canada? We want also to integrate some key indicators relating to mortgage financing. Is the property, does the property have a mortgage? How much of the mortgage is left to finance? So things like that are really important to get, again, discuss, to, under, to make the Canadian realize, okay, how, uh, what's the issue around uh, affordability of housing uh, and debt? We also are planning to improve on accessibility. So Robert made you go through the tables. And what we want to do is we're working on a data visualization tool uh, where we're bringing up all our indicators at the CSD level um, in a, on a map so that you can click and decide, OK, I want non-resident ownership uh, for um, the city of Toronto, the CSD relating to Toronto. Uh, by type of property, and you'll get that directly from a data visualization tool. So we're working on that. We're hoping to be able to start releasing next spring, summer. It's in development right now. So this is regarding the aggregated data. How do we improve the access to this aggregated data? Um, we are working on a, a housing um, statistic hub. Uh, not just for our own program, but for a lot of other data sets of Statistics Canada regarding housing. The first good thing that we did is creating a housing theme. If you go on, the, on our website, you can, you'll see a housing, and that will bring you to different variables and statistics on housing. What we want is to go further. We're working on a prototype of a, it's like a portal or a hub. You, it's a, it's a one-time shop. So you want to know everything about housing, you go there and it gives you this kind of front page that gives you links to various um, statistics surrounding housing. So we're hoping to have that done over the winter. Uh, that you'll see again, not just the Canadian Housing Statistics Program, but data on um, building permits, residential investment census, uh, there's var various things that we'll be working, we are working with different divisions on this. Um, so again, that's on the aggregated side. We are also looking on the more on the heavy for the heavy duty uh, researcher. Uh, we're looking also at providing um, some micro data available in the research data centers for people to come as the employees. Uh, right now, we're working on the documentation on the vetting because when you have administrative data. It's a little bit, you have to assess the quality and the different level of quality from the data provider files all the way to the linkage rate to, okay, what do I get at the end? You have to vet for confidentiality risk in some instances. So we're working on that, and as soon as we're doing, will be done, we can start uh, putting the data out. 
We are also working on a virtual desktop infrastructure technology. We've been piloting uh, with uh, like CMHC, for instance, and we just, it's a way to, for researchers um, to, to access the data from, from a secure place, and it's depending on the level of security, required level of sensitivity of the files. Um, there's different degree, and it could be in your closed office at university, or it could be from Statistics Canada Data Research Center, or from Statistics Canada. There's a whole range, but we're working on trying to make it a bit easier for researchers who want to come and see my employees to access the data. And we're looking at options about real-time uh, remote access, which we already use, but how we use that for our CHSP. But all this requires uh, also working on a quality framework. Again, this is a program based entirely on administrative databases um, coming from outside. Uh, they're all different. They all have different quality. And then you have the quality, you have a lot of complex uh, geocoding to do, like linkage to tax file and other data sets. And we have to be able to uh, assess what's the quality overall and what's the quality at the different types, uh, the different types of quality. So we're working on that uh, as we speak. So the plans, so as you can see, it's a, it's a lot for 2019, but it's going to be moving into also 2020 and beyond. We're going to be onboarding the other jurisdiction with the aim to onboard all jurisdiction by the end of 2022, we hope. We're also planning to try to adjust our analysis and dissemination plan to make it more flexible. Right now, we really try to release based as, as soon as we get a province in, in the door, we, we are trying to understand, interpret the data, uh, and analyze the data, and we try at the same time so, to um, work on some of the variables just to make sure we, we really understand it. So it's hard to come out with a very complex and, and, and um, dissemination plan, multi-year plan. So, but we, we would like to do this as we onboard more provinces. It'll become more clear. Um, we also want to increase partnership with users such as yourself to share expertise and capacity. I mean, we recognize we can't do it all. We work with other division internally and externally with some. Like CMHC is a good example of a partnership where. Uh, you know, we, they provide analytical capacity and expertise, and we do the same, and we work on, uh, on common output. And we'd like to see more of that uh, with other organizations. Um, and um, it's, this partnership is really important, is really key to make sure, again, that this program fits the needs of the public and, and, and responds to the policy requirements uh, on measuring, you know, the, the, the situation of housing, affordability, debt, uh, so the, all these questions. There's so many questions relating to housing, and we can just, uh, and, and it's important to work with the different uh, experts in this field to, to try to uh, come up with a series of data sets and indicators that make sense or are useful to everyone. Um, it's the pro program is only so you, so good as it is kept kept relevant. Um, so this is in a nutshell some of the of the plan work. I wanted to um, finish off with two things. The first one is I just wanted to mention and reiterate some of the issues and challenges with the program. Um, the fact that you not this is a, a program that is not survey. It means. Uh, and we completely rely on external data providers to acquire administrative data files. Um, and uh, it, it has an impact on timeliness, accuracy, and also cost. Our data providers are not all government entities. Some are private, for-profit entities. Uh, and we seem to have, um, so it, 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 it creates a, some unknown there. Another issue is controlling the scope. Everyone wants this program to do everything. We get a lot of requests, there's a lot of pressure. It's exciting, but at the same time, we have to really move gradually through uh, as we onboard our, the different geographies, how we um, start understanding the data and see the potential to link to other data sources. It's important to just um, go gradual with that. And at the same time, we want to meet users' expectations. So you will notice that although we started getting the 
funding for the program in um, April 2017. We've already had three releases, so it's not bad. I um, mean, it's probably a record in terms of how fast Statistics Canada can release uh, good data. Um, we have also uh, our dissemination plan, as I mentioned, is impacted by last minute changes to analysis and priorities. We get various um, departments, organizations, oh, can you do this? Can you add this? Can you do that? So again, it's, we have to play with that and trying to juggle all this. Uh, we are also very mindful of the public perception of the use of administrative data. You probably saw in the media regarding our planned use of uh, tr financial transaction data. Again, we are only doing this as far as it is relevant. In terms of the housing and the financial, it is really relevant to understand the issues surrounding debt and surrounding the financing um, of housing in Canada and the differences the way uh, housing is financed by Canadian, non-Canadian, or resident and non-resident by all and, and people, young people. So there, and, and a lot of that data is just simply not available at the level, is quite survey-based, so we use administrative data. Another big issue and challenge is our ability to obtain sufficient infrastructure, uh, IT infrastructure, not only in terms of the big machines, um, to manipulate big data and bring a lot of data and, and, and analyze the data, but also just in terms of the, the type of software, uh, the type uh, that are, are needed to, to, to do the data analytics and to do also the data visualization. We are also limited in terms of the granularity we can provide to the public by data providers themselves, our contracts uh, at the moment. We are trying to push for at least to be able to release at the municipal level or CSD level, although we are very mindful that people want and we would like to be able to release in some, um, in some CMA at, or some CACs at the census track level because some, especially Vancouver and Toronto, we know that there are pockets in those cities where there are very different stories happening and we want to be able to do this, but this is it's inquire a lot of negotiation with the data providers. Um, because although, again, our statistics allows us to bring the data in, manipulate this in aggregates, and provide data to the public in an aggregated way, we have to be mindful also of the data providers' requirement that they, they don't necessarily want to see that data released uh, at, at a certain uh, lower level. We also need to ensure a common definition of variables across the reduction. As I, me I mentioned, the problem with different assessment dates, different stocks. We also have variables that are not completely defined the same way. We have differences in coding, what's a single, what's a multi. Um, so there's a lot of work, and we, we want to really encourage more of a common um, definition of variable across the reduction. Again, one way to do this is to provide this win-win situation with our provider. When we look at the data, we analyze the data, we go back to the data provider, we gave them more. We gave them documentation, questions, we clean the data for them. So there's a lot for them to benefit from. So uh, we're hoping gradually that we can encourage a more standardized way of, of producing property assessment and land title data in the future. Finally, I'd like to leave the last one for you to, to think and contemplate. It's uh, provided three follow-up questions uh, that we've, uh, we've asked uh, in consultation back in the fall. We had a consultation exercise under the National Consultation Day of StatScan. Um, and it's important for us to understand how, how we can improve uh, the access to the CHSP data. We, I've provided you with some guidelines of where we're going. Um, but just, I'd, I'd like to get more of a, a discussion on this. I also would like to think about, I'd like you to think about what are your priority in terms of housing data gap that should be addressed through this program. There are lots of different things. It's important to get a sense of priority um, to go through. And also, what kind of data do you have in your city, in your province that you're aware of that we may benefit from? For, to assess, to investigate certain housing issues. Because um, again, we do a lot of uh, data integration, but we've, we're learning all the time with our data writer, okay, yeah, but BC has also this, or Ontario has also that, or so it's important for us to understand if you have, you're aware of other data sources that you think might be useful 
to uh, integrate with statistics and that data or other data sources. And finally, I want how do we work better together to achieve those priority needs on housing, research, and analysis? I mentioned the need to make sure that we, have, we, we, we want to develop enough capacity internally and externally to work on housing data, to develop new indicators that are really relevant to the Canadian public. And for us, we need to turn to the, big, the users about how do we work together on this, whether it's to acquire data or leverage data existing, whether it's about analyzing the data and, or helping in the visualization products. Uh, I think it's important of, um, to think about that. Um, and um, Thank you, Anik, and thank you to Robert. I think that's an excellent overview and hopefully really eye-opening for you. everybody on the call to really understand how much information is here and how rich this data set is. And also kind of exciting to be part of something. We've just had a brand new data release last week. And then, um, you know, just to see that there's data coming here and that right now, I mean, and Nick and Robert are working on this and looking for your feedback and, and trying to figure out the best way to go forward here. So I really want to encourage you to take down those questions. We will make sure to get those questions out to you and um, and encourage you to follow up directly with Robert and, and Nick when you've had more time to settle it in. I wanna thank everybody for um, typing in the questions in the question box. I think uh, Robert and Nick have done a good job of keeping on top of them. Um, if there's any more questions, please just keep typing them in there and um, we will have a few more minutes here to answer a few as well. Um, and I think, if anybody has anything to offer right now to answer the questions that are up on your screen, um, please feel free. Uh, maybe you can just um, type them into the box and just put the question number that you are addressing and that will just help people quickly be able to scan through them as well. So thank you, Robert and, and Nick. Um, the presentation will be up on our website. Um, it is not there right now. We like to wait until the presentation is done to make sure that there's nothing we need to add before it gets put up. And so following the presentation um, this evening, both this presentation and then um, the CHSP has also provided a translated version. So we do have a French copy as well. They will both be up on our website at communitydata.ca. I'll make sure that the link gets sent out to everybody who is registered so you'll be able to follow up. And so you'll have these questions and you'll have all the links to the dailies as well that are held in them. Absolutely, Anik. Mary, can I ask a question? The, from the chat the itself? Yes, I can. The, Actually, I can. what I can do is I can put those into a document and I can host those on our website. So you will have the, the yeah, we can have both the um, English and French presentations and then there'll be a separate document that will hold all of the questions that have been coming through on the chat box. Oh, great. Okay, great. Well, that'll be useful because we don't, yeah, so that we can also take a look. It helps us for Absolutely. media lines as well and future uh, questions that we have, but also to get, it will give us a big advantage on understanding better the questions, concern, interests of uh, the users. Uh, there's a, just a comment from Martin Munkin saying any R users. Martin, I don't know the, what does the R stand for? Okay. Okay, great. The R is a, it's a data analytic tool that Martin, I know, I, my son, Martin, I use it. You know, that's why one of the questions that um, came yeah. up was about um, privacy and, 
And Nick and Robert, has there been a lot of issues around privacy? Because I know this is a lot of data coming out of different sources. And um, like you said, you're having to be cautious about what geography to release it out of privacy. Has that been a particularly difficult thing to work around with this data set more so than we deal with, for example, with the census? Uh, yeah, I, I, on our end, it's not a difficulty. The, um, I think the challenge is the level to which the public actually wants information. So uh, if you've been looking at the chat exchanges, uh, many questions have been raised about corporations' mm -hmm. ownership, non-numbered uh, or non unnumbered companies or information about uh, shell corporations or trust, this type of thing. Whenever StatsCan is releasing information, mm -hmm. everything has been classified to the North American industry mm -hmm. classification standard. And the reason for this is because we don't publish data on Walmart. Right. We, we cannot be publishing data so specifically about a corporation. What we do mm -hmm. is we focus on publishing data about all retailers. And so Walmart and Loblaws and everybody else, you know, they're all grouped together under this NAICS classification. So that, that I think that the challenge for us is just that we know that people ha have seen or have heard, uh, there's documentation about some of the activities that are going on in housing that point to the fact that, right. you know, ownership of properties can to some degree be quote unquote hidden because it is kind of sheltered mm -hmm. by a corporation. It's impossible for us to ever release that kind of information. It's, we would immediately be breaking the confidentiality uh, related to that. Now, if there was a significant incident of shell corporations existing, and what I mean by significant, mm -hmm. I mean like if there's hundreds of them, you know, then, then yes, we could talk about them in general in terms of the activities that are taking place for those groups of corporations. Mm -hmm. But at an individual <laughs> level, it's no different for me I, to be publishing data. I can't publish data on Walmart. I can't publish data on John Smith living mm -hmm. in Vancouver if for the same reason. So I think the, the appetite for information, it depends. It has to be balanced. And that's the balanced approach that we're trying to take is to ensure that we're not divulging information that would break the confidentiality rules or disclosure rules. And I just want to add too that on the side of the housing, there hasn't been any issue whatsoever. There's an understanding. Um, I mean, housing is an extremely important and relevant data. And we haven't yet released financial indicators. And my understanding is that's where there were some questions regarding, OK, are you doing due diligence? and uh, to make sure it's relevant to acquire financial transaction data and why it has to be done that way and not the other way. So I think it has to be really about the perception. But again, the idea of working on the, this national database is not to put it out in the public domain that we, oh, here is everyone, we know everyone, what they're doing in this house. It's more to organize profiles, to understand, you know, the profiles of owners, whether, you know, whether they're Canadian or non-Canadian, what's their income, sociodemographic, do they have, and yes, we want to understand if they have mortgages or not, what kind of debt they have, but not, again, at the John Smith level, but mm -hmm. we just at the, just by profile so that we, we get more of a sense of the, the big issues of, uh, you mm -hmm. know, affordability, debt that people go, go through, um, and, uh, before, and, and, we very here, and, and I think it's, a lot of it was just it, it's the perception. Um, but of course, you also have to realize that statistics are it's as, as soon as data comes in, it's anonymized. There's absolutely no way you can go and find the person. It's we statistical number. It's like it's you just we, we transform so that you know, the person can we can't find it's no they can't trace anything. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's the way we're doing it and. That's an important thing to recognize. And also to recognize that this kind of, as actually, it's nothing new. We have been acquiring administrative data like tax file forever. We've done, we've, 
file, mortality file, data file, cancer registry, we have access to cancer registry data, you know, a lot of data like this. Uh, that mm, is, absolutely. It's administrative, there's a, and there's a lot of... Well, I think we're getting close that. to the end of our time Any here. Kind of so I just want to say a no official what. thank you to uh, Nick and to Robert and to Eric as well and the whole team at the CHSP. I really appreciate you taking this time. I know you've had a very busy couple of weeks with the last release. And I think it's just very helpful to have this time where we can take your attention and really focus on what is possible with this data. And I want to say thank you to everybody who attended today and thank you for your questions. Um, as always, your questions are probably not just your own questions, but those of your colleagues. So thank you for asking them and um, getting into some of the nitty gritty details that are here. Like I said, I will make this um, information available on our website. As soon as it is ready to go, we'll get an email out to everyone who's registered. So you'll be able to just follow a link and be able to get all of this. Um, these questions are very useful to Nick and to Robert. So I will make sure those are up. And please just take some time over the next couple of days and go to that, um, that recent release, have a look at the data and think about these questions and, um, and really, you know, take that time to give back and feed into this, um, into this new project. And I'm just going to put up um, in the chat box, that is the link to the most recent daily article. Um, and I believe we have a final contact number. Here's the StatsCan website for anything else um, that you're looking for. And um, you can always contact me and I'm going to put my own email address in here and you can let me know if you have any more questions for Robert and Nick, um, and I'll make sure that they get them as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, it, it's always a good sign when we use up our whole time and the questions are still coming. <laughs>